And now I give the floor to Ed Pinero from uh, Veolia, uh, an infrastructure uh, company, as he defined uh, himself, uh, Veolia. So uh, you have the floor for uh, seven to ten minutes for your introductory remarks. All right, thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, in preparing for this, Terry asked us to be provocative. So the first thing I'm going to do provocative is I have no slides and I'm going to talk from here. <laughs> um, the downside of that is I also to be sustainable and in the 21st century, my notes are on my iPad, not on a piece of paper. So if I suddenly go quiet, it's because my battery died. So just kind of work with me. But um, just very, what I'd like to do very quickly, because I want to make sure we have time for discussion, is, is to um, put, put in perspective this issue of the water infrastructure. and. <laughs> the challenge to be optimistic and opportunities with the word failure in the title uh, was was challenging, but 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 there are there are many op there are many opportunities. We Veolia Water, we are a um, if you don't know us, we operate water systems. Uh, so essentially, when we talk about water infrastructure, we are the water infrastructure. Uh, we are a private for-profit organization, uh, and what we do is, uh, like I said, we operate wastewater treatment plants, water supply plants, and the related infrastructure. We do that for the municipalities as well as for the uh, private sector. So this is a very real issue to us. When we talk about issues facing the water infrastructure when it comes to climate change, to us, it's not we look at it as we use that infrastructure and therefore we should be worried about it. To us, is we are that infrastructure and therefore we have to be very uh, uh, concerned about it. However, to us, that's also a significant opportunity um, to, to innovate. Because as you heard several times today, sometimes if you get too comfortable and nothing changes, nothing changes. And there's no innovation, there's no advancement. So um, the other point I'd like to put, uh, uh, to kind of make, make you aware of is that um, the cause and effect process has many steps. So there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of debate over what causes climate change, but then Climate change causes things. So when we look at what impact we have to worry about with our, with our water infrastructure, it's the impacts associated with climate change that, that things we're concerned about. And in our world, these kind of things include shifting availability patterns. You know, and, and uh, we heard this several times already. There's a lot of water here and not so much there, and that may be different than it used to be in the old in, in prior times. So if our job is to treat water and provide uh, drinking water, where the water is, has become is very significant to us, and therefore we have to be able to um, to, to uh, be aware of and, and be able to adapt to those shifting patterns. With that comes shifts in population and food production, and we've heard that that has obviously impacts on water availability. So everywhere people go, we have to be able to go and adapt. And, and adapt. And of course, there's the things that we always see on the news, like rainfall events and other kind of uh, and flooding issues, those are compounded with the population shifts because the more people that live in a place, it becomes urbanized, impervious surfacing improves, in increases, and the same amount of rainfall that was not a problem 20 years ago now is a, it causes a problem. So we have to kind of deal with that. And then of course there's the severe, the severe weather issues. So when we, when we talk about um, what do we do in our water infrastructure to, to deal with this, we look at these impacts and, um, uh, and, and think about opportunities to be able to adapt to those and, and, and be resilient against those. So there, here's provocative point number two. Understanding climate change and dealing with climate change is very important to us. But those impacts I listed occur whether or not there is climate change. So the reality to us is we have to deal with these issues whether or not we, we, you know, we, we can't stop worrying about it if the climate change patterns change or whatever because we're always going to have these kind of concerns. Those hurricanes come up the Gulf. We operate the New Orleans wastewater treatment plant. When those hurricanes are coming across the Gulf, I really don't care whether it came from climate change or not. I have to be able to adapt. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be um, too light about the issue, but I want to make sure we don't get so fixated on one cause that we don't think about the big picture. Uh, so, uh, so when we think about these issues, we, you know, and we have to worry about catastrophic effects like, um, like happened to us with Katrina where our entire system got basically destroyed. Unfortunately with Isaac, we are still in trailers operating in temporary buildings as a result of Katrina and now we have another, uh, another hurricane to deal with. So, so these kind of catastrophic events, whether or not they're climate change induced, 
are, are, are affecting affect the uh, the water infrastructure. But I would I would argue that um, uh, the subtle impacts like this, particularly the daily climate change, are less dramatic but can actually be more of a concern and we have to be more cognizant of them. And I, and I mentioned that before, the shifting population patterns, shifting food patterns, shifting a water availability patterns. We can't just pick up the infrastructure and put it in the next place that easily. You know, the, so we have to be able to, to deal with that. Um, the, uh, uh, another subtle issue is um, in North America, we're dealing uh, this whole new this air market of shale gas and fracking. Well, that has with it, you have to have a water infrastructure to go along with that, and it does not exist in parts of the country. So there is a, a, a water infrastructure issue that we need to kind of deal with. Um, the other thing is, you know, another issue, we operate the water supply plants in Tampa Bay area in Southern Florida. There, we've had to switch from, change the whole plant operating system from ground surface water to groundwater because of growth, population growth, withdrawing, uh, we, you know, the, the, the groundwater levels are going down, but we need more water, the, the surface water, uh, so we had to switch to surface water to be able to get more water um, to be able to, uh, to continue to provide supply. So the, the, I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that um, uh, in, in being able to adapt to these issues, we see these as opportunities, because in order to make the changes that we have to make, that's an opportunity for innovation. So with the shale gas example, there is no existing infrastructure. We have to put it in. What a great opportunity to do very innovative technology, low water discharge technologies, high, high quality chemistry treatment process for water, things that did not exist 100 years ago in more traditional uh, oil and gas operations, but now we have an opportunity to, to put in this very advanced uh, infrastructure. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to, uh, as I mentioned with the weather issues and the flooding and so on, um, rather than just build bigger plants and bigger stormwater pipes, we could leverage the ecosystem and the whole every area of green infrastructure. In other words, rather than, than trying to deal with these changing flooding patterns or everything with the old way, let's try a new approaches. So every one of these responses to these concerns is an opportunity to do something, to do something innovative. Uh, let, me, let me close by saying um, uh, my, my last provocative, provocative point here. Um, climate change related impacts are a challenge to the water infrastructure, but there's, the two that are actually are more immediate that we, I think we need to be very cognizant of, one is whether or not the infrastructure even exists. With moving population patterns, there's places where there's no, where there's no infrastructure. But the big one that is commonly overlooked is the age of the infrastructure. The, the most immediate failed infrastructure that we're going to run across is not necessarily going to be due to, to um, uh, the, the slower shifting patterns that we see related to climate change is just catastrophic collapse of a system because it's so old. So all of this kind of works into the same picture, but in the process of dealing with that immediate issue, it gives us an opportunity to make the system more resilient to plan for climate change adaptation. So I don't know, I'll, I'll stop there and hopefully we can have a well, good discussion. <laughs> thank you uh, very much, Ed, for this provocative uh, introductory remark. Uh, before uh, giving the floor to, uh, to the audience, few, few, few points I, I would like to have your views of your company. First of all, both your company are global company, global exposure, various country, various context. In the meantime, we know that part of the issue is global. Emission of CO2 is a global issue with an aspiration for a global price uh, of CO2, while another aspect of the issue is very local. Water, the climate impacts themselves, water prices, it has already been touched. How, in such global company like yours, are you addressing this dual dimension of the globality of some aspect of the issue and the very local dimension. Is it an opportunity? Is it a challenge? Uh, any quick remarks of how you can deal uh, in your company with it? Uh, first, Anne, what's, what's the view of Tadcraft uh, between Norway and Africa? Uh, how you deal with uh, various dimensions? Well, thank you for the question. I think it, it, I wouldn't say it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but of course, the climate change issue and the, the growth opportunities for renewable energy is a, clearly a global issue for us. 
in Norway as such, there's not much need for more power right now. There's quite a balanced power market, and there's not much opportunity for that either due to different restrictions. On a global basis, there's much more of an opportunity. When it comes to that, we try to take our experiences from Norway to the global markets, uh, among others, as I mentioned earlier, the sustainability criteria when developing hydropower. And we need to look into the uh, availability of water there when we go for hydropower. On the local level, uh, hydropower is a very regulated uh, business because there are lots of regulations concerning the water and the run, the river and the availability of water. And with that, you need to deal on a very global, on a very local basis. You need to deal with the local stakeholders, starting with the governments, the regional governments, but also the municipalities and the farmers living around. So for us, it's not an either or, it's always both ways and depending on the case. Yeah, um, I think for us, we are a global company, but of course, because of what we do, we operate very locally. And I think what, the way we're dealing with this issue is we leverage our global experience in, into, the, into a, lo a local situation. So um, when I mentioned about the shale gas in the northeastern part of, of the U.S., these are very, very localized issues but we're able to apply these concepts that are much more, much more, um, more global. There's a phrase that I, I, I hate because it, it's, it's a cliche, but it, it fits now, and that is think globally, act locally, and that's really what, what we're talking about doing. It's overused, but I, I think it gets the, it gets the point across. Um, what, one last point on that. One thing that does transcend this global to local scale is knowledge, awareness, and understanding. I think the more we can do to raise awareness and understanding all across the board, then the all the players in their local situations can take that knowledge and apply that knowledge in their specific situation um, and i think that's how you move you can move knowledge lo globally for to to apply into local situations well uh, uh, a last uh, uh, a last uh, questions before going uh, to to the audience you have mentioned that and it is clear uh, the issue is, is also a multi-stakeholder issue. But one of the key uh, way to go for the opportunistic side is the capacity of anticipation of company, and uh, not only to work on the issue of today, but to be able to uh, anticipate the issues and the change ahead, which are not yet there, but which will be there in five years, 10 years, 15 years. How this anticipation is managed uh, within your company? What is the spirit around it? Uh, how you deal with it? Anne? No, Hydropower often has, has the, uh, <laughs> say the, the call of being the grandfather of the technologies, and that can be very rigid then, but we had, that is not the case. That is what I wanted to say. We are dealing with it in a very innovative way. I mean, we try to understand the impacts. We are cooperating between the production side, the uh, R&D side, uh, R&D institutions in various countries as well to learn more and to, to, to improve technologies and also with the market side. As we are operating in, in a market as electricity producer, there are a lot of market instruments which are rather innovative, which we are using, but on the technology side, that is of course uh, very important. We try to attract uh, young uh, employees coming from the universities, trying to attract the best, trying to be an attractive employer um, to, to manage that. I think that's how far I go now. Thank you. Ed, the way Veolia and maybe yourself are working for 2020, 2030, mm -hmm. 2050 yeah. okay. already? Um, well, uh, a part of it is, is why I'm here, and that is um, interacting with the experts and the stakeholders all from all around the world to find out what the issues are and try to start to uh, be able to anticipate. Uh, and then also to leverage the, the, the science and the knowledge that, that we've been able to acquire over 150 plus years of being in existence um, to start to look forward. And, and two very clear examples of things that we've been working on thinking ahead, one is w water reuse technology, because we see going down the, into the future, that's gonna be a very, very important element. Um, and the other one is looking at wastewater as a resource, as a feed, feedstock, as resource recovery, rather than a waste stream. So we've been developing technologies and processes to recover 
materials out of wastewater, which are actually good stuff. It just, because it's in the water, it makes it wastewater. That allows the water to be reused and the materials to be recovered. So those are two examples of thinking ahead of shortages and scarcity and being able to short circuit that, not by, not by stopping development and stopping industrial processes, but by trying to make them less water intensive um, so that you get more, more per gallon, I guess, to, for lack of a better term. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I think we, we have a very good uh, example of the kind of dialogue with the energy part and the water part and see that uh, it's interesting to see that in business with uh, great corporation, you have uh, views which really are able to address. But now I open the floor to the audience for uh, questions, whether detailed or comments. Uh, I see one in here, I see another one, I see a third one, a fourth one. Hi, I'm Charlie Eisling with World Resources Institute. Um, you guys have a lot of years experience working on infrastructure. You also have some knowledge of what's likely to come down the pike in terms of impacts of uh, climate change and uh, growing populations and growing economies on water resources. How are you using this information to help your clients, uh, municipalities, uh, industries, etc.? Uh, I, I'll take the second and which was, uh, yes, and we'll see if the question relates one to another and I'll ask to uh, Ed and Anne to answer. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth Larson with Accenture. Um, I work in the water utility industry in the UK some and they, there's a decreasing environment of being able to spend money on capital expense and operational expense in that the water utility industry is seeing. So I was wondering, this is more for Ed, I guess, um, are there opportunities that Veolia is taking advantage of to leverage IT systems to take advantage of the infrastructure that they already have and manage their existing assets in a more sustainable and efficient way? And then I guess the second question is also, do you uh, in any way leverage your relationships, I guess this um, relates to the first question, with your customers to implement demand side management? So we have extensive, you know, host, uh, we have hose pipe bans, but also drought management publications in the UK. So um, I was wondering if you use that relationship with your customers at all. Thank you. Okay, so first answer on the stakeholder customer demand side management. Okay, I'll give a 30 second answer to it. <laughs> Let me start my answer by saying, uh, visit growingblue.com. <laughs> and the reason I say that, it's a website we created to address both of those issues, which has to do with raising awareness around this water and growth issue, and it has a whole bunch of different things. So that's a big answer. But now, specifically, um, uh, yes, we, we're trying to find the most economic ways to deal with issues. So metering, for example, advanced metering is a great way to deal with existing infrastructure. Some cities in the U.S. have leakage rates of 20 to 40 percent. Um, so knowing where those leaks are is very important. The other thing is, uh, I mentioned earlier, my remarks has to do with leveraging um, the ecosystem. I could either spend $10 million putting in more capacity at the treatment plant or and the supply plant, or we could spend much less than that working with the watershed and the community on offsetting some of the demand. You know, there's two ways to stop the pollutant from getting into the water body. One is to deal with it in the treatment plant, or the other way is try to avoid it from getting into the system in the first place. So we have to start thinking about the water infrastructure, not just the pipes at the treatment plant, but that entire natural and, and, and human composite that we call the, the watershed. That's really part of the, the piping system as well. Oh, okay. Thanks. And <laughs> a, a, any uh, additional view uh, on both aspects? Uh, no, I think it's for us, it's mostly an issue of uh, being open about what we understand of, of, of the challenges and, and share that with with stakeholders, we as a company don't have clients as such. We are mostly acting in the wholesale market. So we don't have that relation to the electricity consumer as we are not a distributor. So there's no direct link there, but we do that uh, by having a very open policy about sharing information and sharing understanding. Thank you very much. So uh, the lady at the very far end, then uh, you with glasses, and then the man with... <laughs> Uh, hair is the same color as mine. Hi, thank you. 
my name is Jessica Shipley. I work for the UK Embassy in Washington, D.C. Um, and one of the things that I cover there is shale gas in the U.S., so this question is regarding that. Um, I'm a bit confused, actually, because I hear a lot about how water is going to be this huge issue for shale gas development in the U.S. and also wherever else it gets developed. Um, but then I also hear a lot of pushback on that and a lot of uncertainty around exactly how big of a problem it's going to be. Um, for example, I guess I, I saw in some article that one shale well over the course of its entire lifetime requires the same amount of water as one golf course uses in three weeks or something like that. Right. So then I thought, well, that's, that's a, a bit of a different number than I was hearing. So I guess my question is for the infrastructure guy, um, how big of, what is the magnitude of the water supply and infrastructure problem for shale gas development in the U.S. or wherever else? Um, in your perspective. Yeah, okay, that, okay, okay. okay. Uh, let, let's take the three oh. questions first and, and we'll answer to be sure that, uh, so the here and, uh, well, the order doesn't matter. <laughs> Just My question has to do with hydropower. I'm Dale Fennessy with the Council of Great Lakes Industries. And in the US, there's a movement towards removal of dams um, for a number of reasons. Most of it run of river situations or uh, an admiral's fish migration and all that sort of thing. Um, how do you see those issues uh, impacting your drive to increase hydropower in the climate change uh, realm? Thank you. And the third question here. Yeah. I think most Carpuzo from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, I have a couple of questions that are sort of related to both your presentations. Um, the first one is sort of a, a concern uh, about uh, kind of the renewable energy sector um, and how that sort of is played out. Um, the fact that there's this kind of assertion that renewable energy is not really a profitable business. And I think that's something that we hear a lot from sort of big energy sort of lobbies and that, that kind of discussion. And I was wondering, uh, and kind of linking to what uh, um, Terry said about the kind of global and local links, I wonder if you've thought about or if you've come across challenges and opportunities uh, on a kind of global, local dimension that, 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 that link to this assertion, basically, that renewables are not a profitable business. And um, the second is about, you mentioned, Anne, in your presentation about uh, this uh, issue of uh, a large untapped potential to do with um, hydropower. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I saw your map, and I mean, a lot of this kind of untapped potential is in particularly challenging environments where there's high poverty, and um, there are sort of a lot of social and economic challenges. So I wonder if we were to kind of tap into that potential in these really challenging environments, we would, re would we require a different approach? And what sort of approach that might be, particularly where we have situations where there's absolutely no infrastructure to deal with either water or energy? So these two questions. Thank you very much. So I think we have a, quite a clear uh, repartition of who yeah. is going to answer to what from the questions. Yeah. It's also pretty clear who got the hard one. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was me until I heard the second one, so I, I got off pretty easy on this one. Um, I think the, the real answer to that with the shale gas issue that's causing the controversy is, is the word got left out of the sentence. Water could be an issue with the whole shale gas and fracking market. What's going to depend on is how this whole issue, the water resource is managed in that. The actual technology of shale gas drilling and fracturing is actually very old. I, I, I started my career in the oil and gas industry 30 plus years ago, and I was fracking wells back then, and, and by then, and, and that was already old by then. The challenge is your water, uh, how much water is available and what happens to the quality. I can say firsthand knowledge, the technology to treat the water and manage the water to minimize, if not eliminate, the quality and the quantity concerns exists. The issue is awareness, knowledge, and application in the right, and understanding the locality of water. The shale gas issue is a perfect example of the locality of water, because that problem changes within miles. Not, it's not a regional thing, it's actually that local. Uh, and it's also a good example of the energy water nexus. The make or break for the shale gas market, in, 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 in large part, uh, one of the critical factors will be water. It's not the technology. It's, uh, there's other issues too, like having to do with the quality of the drilling and all that kind of stuff. But, but in terms, it's, it's really the water issue that's going to really affect how well that market takes off. But it's, rest assured, 
that the technology does exist. This is not something we have to invent 20 years from now. Right now, today, the technology exists to manage that water very, very, very well. So now you get the hard question. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. So, and I think most of the, the other question is about renewable hydropower. And hydropower, and I try <laughs> with the hard questions. The first one was on, on the issues on the US with removal of dams and, and uh, constraints for hydropower or the, the limits to growth, to put it that way. And of course, that is an issue. I mean, as I showed on one of my, my uh, slides, 75% of the dams were originally built not for hydropower, but for other reasons, for irrigation and flood control. And only 25 are only used 25% for hydropower issues. But it is an issue. Um, also in Europe, we see that more restraints to using hydropower is, of course, detrimental to what we see as mitigation to climate change. And we try to, uh, to, be, to make politicians aware of that, to ask for different policy instruments to go hand in hand, to look across different initiatives and see how the uh, effects are and how you can keep your global, your, your, your overall target. And there will always be a balance between climate change uh, targets or climate targets and other environmental targets and industry uh, development and growth and uh, local development and so on. There's a balance. That is something we can face, I think. And there are lots of instruments how the hydropower sector can handle that. I mean, building fishing traps, we are doing that in all the rivers in Norway. No, uh, Startcraft is the largest fish producer, the, you know, the small fish, fish, uh, how do you that, say that, the growth, making the fish grow in the country because there's, that's part of the concession to, to keep the fish in the different reservoirs. There's, there are possible opportunities linked to that as well, but it is a challenge and lots of that is politically decided and that we try to deal with through stakeholder management and uh, through awareness increasing, increasing the awareness of those issues. Um, and the other sec question on the profitability of renewable energies, uh, that is also an issue, of course. Uh, hydropower is very often at the margin. I mean, hydropower as such is a profitable industry. Otherwise, we would not have such a big share of hydropower. Many of the new developments are at the margin, depending on how the market is structured and how the price uh, estimates are. We are always, I mean, usually we are operating in a market where there's no market in countries where we are investing. We are, uh, we are trying to establish a market. We are trying to make contracts to have some security. I mean, we are coming back a little bit to the issues of the last panel as well on the financing issues and the long-term views of renewable energy. Those plants have a much longer lifetime than many of the other energy plants. And that is a challenge, of course. I mean, well, in view of the time, uh, we will close the panel and I will leave to uh, Fred to make the conclusion and the lesson. But to both of you, thanks for having shown that thinking for solution is thinking for business and new business and innovative one, and it is thinking for profit. So you have perfectly matched the goal which was said in the title of the seminar, that thinking for profit in a shifting water case is not something which uh, we should uh, fade out and not look at it in a very positive way. Thank you very much.